Thank you, Catherine. I can add one thing. If you're here from the press and we come to you with a microphone to ask a question, please identify yourselves what, uh, what organization you're with. Um, in 1852, Yale's Boat Club took on a similar team from Harvard on New Hampshire's Lake Winnipesaukee. I'm pretty sure no one present that day could have ever guessed that they were witnessing the beginnings of a multi-billion dollar athletic arms race that would attract 400,000 men and women student athletes to participate in hundreds of sanctioned sports every year. Of course, countless millions of people attend intercollegiate games, read about them or watch them on television or on their computers. It literally couldn't be much more different than a bunch of quaint Ivy Leaguers rowing on a New England lake in funny sweaters. And with the explosion in interest in investment and in value of intercollegiate athletics, you need really talented people to manage the coaches, teams, facilities, and players. Uh, to work on this introduction, I recently did what I urge my students not to do and did some internet research. <laughs> if you type athletic director into Google, you actually get a description of what an athletic director does. I thought I would read it here for a second. An athletic director the web tells me, works on average 40 hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> it said that. It's the internet. It's got to be true. Uh, not counting the weekends when he attends games to oversee their running and connect with other administrators. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, an athletic director at a medium-level college makes an average salary of $68,000. <laughs> uh, Ivy universities or those colleges with teams that are positioned well in the intercollegiate athletic table make over $100,000 a year. Got to be true. It's on the Internet. Uh, things have changed a bit. Even in the 1980s, uh, when he was starting out as a full-time athlete, uh, full AD, even earlier, tonight's guest was, I'm sure, working the same killer hours he's famous for here in Lawrence, way more than 40. And I can think of no one better positioned to address us tonight on how his job and college athletics has changed since he be began his career. Really at a very similar time uh, to that time when intercollegiate competition was becoming something more than games, more than student athletes, more than fans. Uh, tonight, Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey, who will be conducting tonight's interview, uh, and I, both know, uh, and we knew as soon as we started our Leadership and Globalization in Sports series that we needed to persuade our colleague Lou Perkins to talk to us about college sports and leadership in college sports and how it continues to evolve. Tonight's speaker is a, na a native of Chelsea, Massachusetts. As a high school student, Lou Perkins was a highly recruited basketball player. He ended up choosing the University of Iowa and Hall of Fame coach and KU graduate Ralph Miller. Perkins earned his undergraduate degree at Iowa in 1967. For the next decade, he served as director of athletics and head basketball coach. Can you imagine that still being one job? At the University of South Carolina, Aiken, as that institution grew from a junior college to a full-fledged four-year institution. He received his master's degree in education from the University of South Carolina. Perkins served as athletics director at the University of Maryland from 1987 to 1990. I grew up in Maryland and remember well the situation he inherited there. Uh, a basketball star and a, just a terrific young man with a spectacular gift, Len Bias had died of a drug overdose immediately after being drafted, drafted by the Boston Celtics, and an investigation had turned up some pretty nasty things. Perkins had to come in there and clean up this horrible mess, and he hired a coach named Gary Williams to coach that basketball team, left the program, I think we can all agree, far better shape than he found it. From 1990 to 2003, Perkins served as athletic director for a university in Storrs, Connecticut, you may have heard of, called UConn. By the time he left, the program saw a whopping six NCAA national championships, including four in women's basketball, one in men's basketball, and one in men's soccer. He also brought Division I football to the university, which is now in the Big East Conference. For these achievements, compounded with an unprecedented improvement to Connecticut's athletic facilities, Perkins was awarded the inaugural National Athletic Director of the Year Award in 2000. Lou Perkins has served as Director of Athletics here at the University of Kansas, since 2003, and has been instrumental in guiding KU Athletics to impressive growth, athletically, academically, and financially. Over the past five years, Perkins has increased the athletic department budget from about $24 million to almost $61 million. Student athletes have, over the last four semesters, earned either a 3.0 grade point average or just a sliver below, five hundredths of a percent below. I know that because I've been on the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Athletics for the last three years, and I see the numbers. That is truly an unbelievable and impressive statistic. My average grade point average in my history classes is well, well below 2.99. Um, 
Sorry, Catherine. <laughs> He's, she's great. She's going to get an A. That summer, um, oh, and in the past, uh, in 2008, of course, we all know, KU became just the second school ever to win a men's basketball title and a BCS bowl game in the same year. That summer, Perkins topped the public voting in Time Magazine's online poll of the best sports executives in the world. He was the only college sports administrator to make Time's list of 35 individuals, which if you look at this edition, it, it includes team owners, team managers, league commissioners, and other executives from across the planet. It's really too close to call whether Lou Perkins or Barack Obama had a better 2008. <laughs> now, well, every year can't be 2008, but I really look forward to hearing what our athletic director has to say tonight on the topic of leadership and globalization in sports. Please join me in warmly welcoming Lou Perkins to the stage at the Dolan School. Lou, it's great to have you here. Um, can you start by telling us a little bit about where and how you were raised and educated and how you made the decision to get into uh, college athletic management? Well. Uh, as I think uh, Jonathan said earlier, I was born and raised in a very uh, industrial, industrialist community right outside of Boston, a place called Chelsea, Massachusetts. It was two square miles. Uh, it was 30,000 people. My dad was a mechanic in a uh, paper factory, and he worked midnight shifts. And my mom was a house um, a person, stayed at home in the house. And, and uh, I was very fortunate that I had some great mentors who, uh, who geared me towards playing college basketball and high school basketball because a lot of my friends who I grew up with uh, um, really didn't have the opportunity to go to college or, or uh, most of the kids who, who I went to school with uh, uh, never went beyond high school and, and a lot of our kids that I went to school with dropped out of high school. So I was very fortunate that I had some great people who were very, very fortunate in giving me the right direction. Um, I was first generation person in my family, all my cousins, and all my family to go to college. And, and I made a, a, a uh, in my opinion, one of the best decisions I've ever made, Bill, and I had to uh, leave home, leave my, my family and my friends and, and travel to uh, the University of Iowa and I had the opportunity to play for Ralph Miller. And, and uh, it was uh, something that uh, to this day I think is one of the greatest things that ever happened to me personally. Uh, and besides playing basketball and getting a great education, uh, I had the opportunity to meet my wonderful wife, who we've been married for 42 years. And uh, we have two wonderful daughters and two granddaughters. And, and uh, probably the best week, I, this is a little sidetrack, but probably the best week I've had in probably in the last 25 years was this past week because my seven-year-old granddaughter came and, and uh, I gave her for Christmas two tickets to Taylor Swift. And <laughs> And uh, for the whole week, all I heard was Taylor Swift songs, which I didn't know who Taylor Swift was, but, <laughs> but I think I know every song right now. And uh, we, we, uh, we ended up, uh, uh, she ended up playing basketball with Cole Aldridge, and I bought her, her first set of golf clubs this week, and we hit golf balls together. So, uh, but I was very, very lucky that I had the opportunity to leave my hometown where a lot of my friends haven't ever, ever, ever got out of there and, and I had the opportunity to, to live in a different part of the country and, and see different kinds of people. But uh, I'm grateful for my parents. Uh, my dad worked very hard. Uh, uh, he, he supplied all the kinds of things and my mother supplied all the love that I needed to, to help me through some very, very difficult early childhood things. How did you wind up in, in sports management? Well, you know, I, I like everybody else. I went to college, and my first semester I was going to be, and I was in pre-law, and I barely got through um, my first year of eligibility, and, and then I said, oh, gee, this is easy. I think I'll go in and, uh, you know, uh, try to go into medical school since I wasn't very good in pre-law, and obviously after <laughs> one, one semester that wasn't very good. And, and I happened to meet a person, uh, uh, in those days, there weren't any sports management classes. You either went into physical education or recreation. And because I love to help people, and, and uh, I got an undergraduate degree, a lot of people don't know this, in recreation therapy. And I worked, my first job out of college was in Norristown, Pennsylvania, 
at a state mental hospital. Uh, and I was in Building 51, Maxim Security. And the only thing that I, uh, I remember is that after a, a year, my wife looked at me and said, we cannot do this the rest of our lives. Uh, it was very, very difficult. And, you know, people always talk about making tough decisions, and, and I made a lot of tough decisions because back in, the six, uh, back in the 60s, in the early 70s, state mental hospitals were not what you would think like assisted living and all those kinds of things. There were a lot of people in that hospital that didn't deserve to be there, and uh, their children put them there because there was no other place for them to go, so they went to state mental hospitals. and. and and I, you know, again, I was in max security because I was a big guy and they all thought that, you know, I could handle all these people who really weren't uh, supposed to be very bright or very smart and, and probably uh, in some cases were trying to harm themselves. Um, and I, I bucked the system right away. Um, uh, one of the things we used to do is, is take these uh, patients and we would put them on a bus and take them down, down, downtown Philadelphia to baseball games and things like that. And, and I made really, really good administrative decisions because if I felt like they really didn't belong there, I just told them to go away and I gave them personal money and, and hopefully the police didn't pick them up and bring them back. And, and in some cases I had no idea whatever happened to them, but I knew it was a better place to live and a better place to be than to be in that mental hospital. But after a year, I knew I couldn't do that the rest of my life. and, and uh, uh, I was very fortunate. Gwen's dad was college president, and at the time, um, um, he was the vice president of the University of South Carolina, and we packed up uh, a little um, car with our dog and cat, and we drove to Columbia, South Carolina to go ahead and work on a master's degree, and, and I actually um, hadn't done any student teaching because I wanted to be a, 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 guidance, a guidance, high school guidance counselor. And so I went ahead and got a master's degree in education, and I had to do student teaching. I did student teaching at a local high school, airport high school, which is still there. And I helped the basketball coach. He asked me because he found out I played basketball in college, and, and uh, we won the state championship. And the only time they've ever won the state championship, and he tried to give me all the credit, which I had no idea what I was doing. But uh, he was a great coach, and, and from there uh, I took on, uh, uh, I got my master's degree in, and there were little schools that were opening up throughout the state of South Carolina, little community colleges, and they were looking for athletic programs. And I went to the University of South Carolina. I was the first athletic director, first basketball coach, first tennis coach. I drove the school bus, Gwen washed the uniforms. Um, you name it, we did it. I taught three classes and probably had the greatest experience I ever had. So I didn't learn it in the classroom. I learned it from first-hand <coughs> experience. And, and to this day, I'm, I'm very close to the people at Aiken, and I'm, I feel very, very fortunate that I had that opportunity because I think I'm a better athletic administrator because of the experience I had back then. Mm -hmm. When you arrived on campus at Lawrence, <coughs> after a, a certain period of time, you must have known, you know, having done this at other campuses strategically, what you needed to do, what you needed to accomplish. Kind of share with us your thought process on how you approach that and kind of lay out what your vision or your goals were after you'd had a chance to really kind of understand the lay of the land? Well, you know, th that's a really good question uh, uh, and thought, Bill, but I didn't have a lot of time. Um, uh, when Chancellor Hemingway hired me and, and, and Drew hired me, they, they, and Drew had been the interim athletic director, he really had done a great job of, of identifying what the problems were and, and uh, he, he did some strategic things, and, and when I came here, he kind of laid those all out to me. Uh, what he forgot to do, and, and I asked the questions to the chancellor who's sitting back there, and I, and I have such great respect for him, but, but he forgot to tell me that there were some NCAA problems. He forgot to tell me that there were some Title IX problems. He forgot to tell me that we had no money. And, and, but he, he, t he told me all these other things that we needed to do, but didn't tell me those kinds of things. And, and I kid Drew about that now, but uh, we had to roll up our sleeves very quickly and we had to uh, do some things that were, weren't very popular. Uh, one of them obviously is, is raising money and, and uh, because we had no money and in order for us to compete. One of the things I, I do think that happened, and I'm kind of flip-flopping on you a little bit, Bill, but when the, when, when, Kansas made the decision to enter into the Big 12. 
from the Big Eight because the Big, the Big Eight, they were very competitive. But all of a sudden, when you start to add schools like Texas and A&M and, and Tech and, and some other schools, uh, they weren't prepared to do that. And, and I had experienced the same kind of thing at Connecticut because Connecticut was thrown to the wolves when they were uh, asked to go into the Big East and they weren't prepared to do that. And we had to do a lot of catch up. And I think that's exactly what we had to do here. We had a lot of catch up to do. You know, I think it's, it's pretty well documented. We had financial issues. We had facilities issue, issues. Uh, there were all kinds of things that, uh, that they weren't prepared to take on when you had to compete against the kind of schools that we have to compete in on a day-to-day -day basis. I believe it was the right decision to go into the Big 12, but I, I don't think they were prepared to do that. And uh, so we didn't have a lot of time. We had to roll up our sleeves. We had to make uh, decisions about finances. We had to make decisions about facilities. We had to make decisions about fundraising academically. You know, and I still believe, and, and I believe when I, I came here, I inherited the, probably the best academic person in the country, and Paul Buskirk and his staff. And they were really good, but you know, I made a commitment to Paul that we wanted to be the very, very best, and and I think we, you know, with our new facilities and the staffing that we've given him and and the leadership that he's provided, we probably have. And, and I don't, I would go against anybody in the country. We have the best academic program in the country. I met with Larry McGee, and I, who's our uh, director of sports medicine. I said, Larry, you know, what do we need to do? And, and he he laid out a plan for me, and he said, this is what we have to do to be the best. And in the last three years, our sports medicine program has won the Big 12 sports medicine program in the country. Um, so we've done the things that our people have told us, and we've done it in a very short period of time. And that's caused some problems. I think people have looked at what we've done and, and, and think that we've done it for selfish reasons, but we really haven't. We've really tried to put our university and our athletic program in a position where we can compete with everybody in the league. We're not there yet. We have a lot of things we have to do. But you know, we're chipping away, you know, kind of the academic thing, the sports medicine facilities. Um, you know, we have a lot of other things that we have to do. But I think we've rolled up our sleeves. We did it very, very quickly. In some cases, probably too quickly too. But we had no choice. One of the tough decisions that you made was to institute a point system for ticket allocation. Talk a little bit about why you did that and how that was received. Well, first of all, it wasn't received very well. <laughs> and, and, and because of some things that's happening right now, it's probably not received even you know, as well as it, it should be even now. But, but because of financially in the, that we had to do some things very quickly, as I mentioned, we had to make that very difficult. I wish we could have taken more time to make that decision and we could have ruled it out in a longer period of time. But we really didn't. I mean, we were just falling further and further behind. And, and, I, and we, need, we knew that we couldn't go to the university and ask for money. You know, there are a lot of schools who are getting tuition waivers, getting free tuition. You know, uh, you know i give you a perfect example. At the University of Connecticut when I was there, we, we got $100 million to build a football stadium from the state of, uh, from the state of Connecticut. There was no way that was happening here. And, and shouldn't have happened. It was, it's the right thing not to happen because of all the other kinds of things and, and necessities that have to happen at this university and all the budget crisis. So we had to change the attitude and not rely on the university and not you know beg, borrow, and steal. What we had to do was take the initiative on our own, and we had to go out and ask our donors if they really wanted us to be the very, very best, that they were going to have to help us uh, put ourselves in a position to uh, finance facilities, finance uh, you know our academic programs, finance our sports medicine program, finance everything that we're doing, travel and all those kinds of things, uh, so that we can attract the best of the best. And, and Jonathan talked about our academic, uh, you know, uh, what we've done academically. In in you know when you're recruiting against North Carolina and Duke and, and Stanford and Cal Berkeley, and, and that's who we're recruiting in almost every sport. Those are the schools that we're recruiting against. We had to put our coaches, we couldn't let them, you know, fall further and further behind. We had to do a lot of catch up in a very quick amount of time. And, and we're not quite there yet. We think we are getting closer and closer. But we had to do something in, in the point system. We were one of the few schools in the country at the time that didn't have a point system. 
Uh, and uh, we needed to do that, and we did it very quickly. And for the most part, even though I, you know, we've upset some people, and right, you know, they have a right to be upset, but we really didn't have a choice, and we had to do it. And I think the, the long-time benefits is going to be better for our athletic program, and more importantly, better for our university, and the most important, better for our student-athletes. How would you describe your leadership style, Lou? <laughs> I'm probably not the one to say that. <laughs> I, I think you can ask a lot of people. You know, I'm very direct. Um, I don't believe in micromanaging, and I'd probably get in trouble for not probably overseeing, you know, things more closely. Uh, but I think you, you know, I think you're, you're all about hiring good people and giving them the ability to do their job and be there. I, my, I, I believe my my responsibility with our coaches and our staff and and, and is to be a resource, be a mentor, to help, but I don't want to get in, in the way of do, people doing a good job. I know when I was coming up in a business, I, I was very fortunate to work with for some great, great people, and they allowed me to do my job, and when I needed help, uh, I, I was able to do that. I, I'm very lucky because, you know, uh, Bob Hemingway was great, uh, Chancellor Gray Little is great, you know, they, they you know, they, I, They've allowed me to do my job, but I keep them informed, and I want that same kind of relationship with our people. Um, I probably had one of the nicest compliments I think I could ever have last night at the basketball banquet when Bill Self thanked me, and he said, if I ever had, Bill said this, if I ever had a situation I needed somebody to cover me, I, you know, I'd want Lou Perkins to do that. So that's how I look at my job, is to be there as a resource, to be there to help people. And unfortunately, I have to make some very, very difficult decisions and sometimes very unpopular. I feel like I'm a, an umpire in a football game or a baseball game or a basketball game. Half the people love what you do and half the people don't love what you do. And, and you can't, I, I wish I could please everybody. Uh, the only one I really want to please is my wife because uh, <laughs> she controls everything. But uh, <laughs> and I'm not dumb when it comes to that. I'm not the smartest guy, but I'm not the dumbest either. But you know, when I think you know, it's, I look at the president of the United States, whoever that is, and, and the kind of tough decisions they have to make, and you know, they, they have to worry about their political career, and they have to worry about you know foreign policy, and they have to worry about you know, everything that you could possibly think of, and they're going to make decisions that aren't popular. And that's kind of where we are. And, and I think because of the, of the uh, you know, when I got into business 20 years ago, we used to beg people to come to games and, and, and cover us, the media. And now with the internet and, and Facebook and Twitter, and uh, I mean, I, I, there's probably a hundred other things out there that I have no idea about. There isn't anything that we in college athletics can do that, it's going to please everybody, and uh, you know we're so exposed, we're so wide open, and I think what you have to do is, is sit down with your staff and the people around you and get the mission of the university and what they want you to do, and you just have to make decisions and live with them. And you know it's like anything else. If you have a hundred decisions and you make 90, 90 of them are great and ten of them are bad, you you hate that you made ten bad ones, but hopefully the ninety are, are good. I know that in a job like you have, there is no such thing as an average day, but talk a little bit about some of the things on any given day that you might spend your time doing. Well, <clears throat> well, well uh, I think in the course of a day, we're, we're dealing with academics, we're dealing with uh, medical things, we're dealing with transfers, we're dealing with travel, we're dealing with scheduling, uh, we're dealing with uh, media. You know, I, Poor Jim Marcioni, he's here today. You know, every day we're dealing with, you know, you know we get FOI'd on everything that you possibly can get FOI'd on, and, and we have to respond to those kinds of things. That's a full time daily thing. Uh, you know, we have, you know, a lot of public relations. We have to, we have probably have more oversight committees and groups that look at college athletics. And, and, and I want to be real clear, Bill, this is not just Kansas. This is, I mean, we go to meetings and we all look at each other and say, what are we doing? I mean, it's kind of, you know, we all have the same situation. So it's, you know, I'm not saying it's just at Kansas, but, you know, we deal, we deal with every social aspect of every student that we, we have. We have 600 and plus kids and we have over 200 staff people. So we, you know, we have close to 800 to 
excuse me, a thousand people that we're responsible for. And you, you can't imagine the kinds of things that we have. You know, a kid's, you know, uh, mother or father passed. We had a situation, unfortunately, in baseball uh, just recently, and it's been well documented, documented that one of our baseball kids, his mother came to the baseball game on Sunday, and Monday morning he gets a call that she passed away. Well, you know, when you have to deal with that, that's something you have to drop everything else that you have to deal with. And when you have 600 kids, we deal with every possible kind of thing. And uh, I think we're seeing more and more kids coming to universities and coming to athletic programs who have all kinds of social issues, all kinds of background things that weren't taken care of, you know, previously, and we have to deal with those. And, and thank God we have the, the ability to help those kids. And, and so we're dealing with all kinds. I mean, there's, you can only imagine the kinds of things that we have to deal with. And whatever you can imagine, we're dealing with it more. You, then you have coaches, too. Right. And I have the greatest line, Bill, and I say this publicly. Uh, <laughs> when I was at the University of Connecticut, you know, we had uh, two very high-profile coaches uh, in basketball, male and female. And, and the uh, president there, who's a dear friend of mine, used to tell me all the time that uh, you're the, probably the highest paid diaper changer in the world. All I was doing was going from one office to the other, you know, like trying to help everybody go together. So, and he, we say that in jest, but, you know, you're dealing with some very, very powerful people on a day-to-day -day basis. And you have to be on your, your highest level of expertise and you have to have a balance between everything. Balance, balance, balance. We talk about balance all the time. And we talk about being truthful. What's interesting is we can be truthful when people don't believe us. So, you know, that's something that happens because everybody has their own agenda and have their own way of thinking about things. You mentioned, Lou, that one of the toughest things that you have to do as an athletic director is making a decision to change a coach. What goes into your thought process on that? What are the factors in that? Well, I, I think, you know, the, probably the most important thing is integrity. And we think it's very, very important that we have coaches with, with the highest integrity. And, and we, we want people who are great motivators, people who, we're asking a lot of our coaches. You know, we ask them to be heavily involved in the community. We ask them to be heavily involved in the student athlete's life. We're asking them to be heavily involved in all social aspects of, 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 of young men or women. You know, you know, it's tough. I mean, kids have a lot of problems. And we're dealing with, uh, you know, if you look at football, there's 100 plus kids in a football program. And every kid is different. So uh, I, you look for coaches who can balance a lot of things at the same time. Uh, you know, you might have a coach that uh, loses a game and then has to walk into a auditorium and meet with the media. You know, a lot of business people in regular, what I would call regular business, they have a bad day. They don't have to be accountable to anybody. Our coaches have a bad day and they have to be accountable to everybody. So you need, you need people with charisma, you need people with honesty, you need people with integrity, you need people who who understand uh, that a student athlete has to balance a lot of things besides just playing a sport. You know, there's a you know, girlfriend or boyfriend, there's parents, there's you know, people next door in the dorm, it's, it's uh, you know, people who or you grew up with. I mean, there are so many issues on a day-to-day -day basis that our coaches have to deal with. And you have to look for somebody who can balance all those kinds of things. Do you think the, do you feel that the salaries that are paid and in college athletics are in balance compared to the sal salaries paid on the academic side? Uh, there's no question in my mind, and, but we are in an arms race. Um, you know, it's, 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 you know I, I once went to a conference and I heard John Thompson, the great basketball player at Georgetown, uh, this was probably 10 years ago when he was working for Nike and people were criticizing him because of the kind of money he worked, he was making, and he had the greatest line, and I still use it every day. Thank God well, he lives in America, and we live in a capitalistic society, and he has, this is a kid from, from the, you know, the inner city of New York who worked very hard to become very successful, and he's reaping the benefits of that, and people were against that. And, uh, but I do think, you know, I, I look at firemen, policemen, teachers, nurses, I, and I, I don't quite understand uh, why they're not being paid, you know, more. Uh, but I also look at our coaches, and if we want to compete 
at the highest level and have the best coaches, best administrators, we're going to have to pay those people. So I didn't make the rules. I'm trying to follow the rules. And uh, I don't think any coach or myself or an administrator, when somebody offers you something, you're going to say, no, I don't want to do that because nobody else is getting it. So that's why it's great to be an American. In the NCAA tournament that just concluded, 39 out of 65 teams had a player born outside the country with a total of 68 international players in, in the big dance. Do you see this globalization trend here on campus and how do you see that affecting other sports? Well, I think all you have to do is go to the NBA right now and, and uh, I listen, you know, sometimes I'm not a big NBA person, but you, if you listen to the NBA, the announcers have a, a very difficult time pronouncing the names. Uh, but I think we have to put that all aside because we, you know, at universities, in Kansas is one of the great ones, we're all about diversity. And I think the more cultures and the more kinds of things that we can bring to our campus is, is beneficial. Um, so I'm not opposed to having foreign athletes or, you know, people from any place. You know, we want to have the best kids and, and if that kid, you know, there's probably no better kid and, and Cole knows is Sasha Khan, you know, he's a young man from Russia and, and I think we're a better university and, and a better basketball team and a better, I'm a better person because of my relationship with, with Sasha and what he's taught us and, and brought to this university. So. Uh, I am absolutely not opposed to that, and, and as long as everybody is given the same fair chance to be competitive and have an opportunity to compete, we should not ever close the doors to anybody. You see that continuing to oh, increase? Yeah, no question about it. Okay. No question about it. Uh, you've talked, we've talked a lot tonight about the importance of academics and of preparing student athletes. Uh, the Secretary of Education pointed out right before the tournament that 12 out of 65 programs had graduation rates below 40 percent. Now I know that doesn't apply to KU, but it does apply to Big 12 schools like Missouri and Baylor uh, from the Big 12. Should the NCAA have a minimal graduation rate for participation in postseason play? Well, first of all, I'm not going to talk about Baylor or Missouri, so that's the first thing, Bill. Uh, they're both great academic universities, and, and uh, you know, graduation is very, very important, and I don't want to minimize gradu graduation in my statement, and I hope people don't take this the wrong way. I, I mean, I, I am uh, the perfect example of a person who had the opportunity to go to college and came from a background that I, my parents had no idea what college education was at the time. And if I wasn't fortunate to get an athletic scholarship, I wouldn't have gone to college. I would have worked uh, with my dad someplace. I, I've always said this. I think giving young people the opportunity, if it's one year or two years or three years, to go to college and have great experience, not only in the academic world, but travel and socialization and all those things, to me is as important as getting a degree. I mean, I, I think getting a degree is, I mean, I, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It's, it's helped me more than anything in, in the whole wide world. But I'm also a firm believer if we can take kids and give them the opportunity to be in college for one year or two years. You know, everybody says, you know, Cole Allred, you know, he should come back another year. He owes it to the university, he owes it. He's done everything that we've asked him to do. Uh, and he, you know, I think most of us will agree that you go to college to hopefully get a job and that you're going to further your opportunity by going to college. And I think, again, just using Cole, he, he's done everything that we've asked him to do and he's going to go on and, and have a, a professional career and, and he's going to be able to do a lot of great things for himself and his family and, and, and hopefully our <coughs> university. So I'm about graduation and I think graduation rates are important. I think sometimes we get lost in what it's all about and uh, you know every school is different and I don't think you can say everybody has to be on the same plane. You know our mission at Kansas is different than the mission at maybe uh, Harvard or Yale and we should not have to, uh, our kids should not be uh, measured the same way as those kids at Harvard and Yale. I'd put our kids against Harvard and Yale any day, they need to look up to us. Uh, because we really give our kids a great education. But I'm, I'm not totally convinced that a kid has to graduate. Now, I am convinced that they're here, they need to go to class, and they need to take <laughs> advantage of that. 
but if they choose to go in a different direction after graduation, uh, I understand that. And, and you know what? What people don't, don't measure, and I'm sure the Secretary of Education is a lot smarter than I am, uh, but you know, kids leave college for all kinds of reasons that have nothing to do with athletics. And sometimes they choose a school that they really can't compete in academically. Sometimes they choose a, a school and then they have to go home because they have to take care of their parents. There, there could be a death in the family. Uh, sometimes uh, kids come to a university and then they have to transfer to another school. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that affect graduation rates. And as much as I, I feel like graduation rates are important, I think sometimes it's overemphasized. Okay. Being a leader means that sometimes you got to deal with, with tough issues. And uh, uh, what one of the ones I want to ask you about is last fall there was a series of altercations between members of the basketball team and the football team. When you heard about that, what were your thoughts and what action did you take? Well, my first thought is that I want to kill every one of them. So uh, if I had them <laughs> close to me, and probably not kill them, but I was ready to do some physical damage except that I looked at some of those kids and said, maybe, Lou, you need to back off a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, really preach, we really preach family. And sometimes within a family relationship, people have disagreements. And there was certainly a major disagreement between some basketball players and football players that could have been handled totally different and I was very, very disappointed with that. But uh, um, I think there's a couple of football players here and a couple of basketball players here who know that I brought them into the auditorium and probably said some things that I regret that I said publicly to them. Uh, and I think they all felt the same way coming back, that they knew that they embarrassed the university, they embarrassed themselves, they embarrassed their teams, embarrassed the athletic department and the student body. And, and uh, we were... Uh, I don't want to say quickly in terms of one day or two days, but within a week we had this put, put to bed and we had to address it and it was embarrassing and it was distasteful. And uh, I think every one of them that were involved in it probably wished they hadn't done that. And they now, and I guess we look at it as, you know, and I don't want to minimize this, but they look at it as a learning, a learning experience and, and I have a, a Probably people laugh at me, but I, I, I say that you know people put erases on pencils for a reason because people make mistakes. And our young people made some mistakes, so we we would never erase it, but we tried to correct it. And we we dealt with it straight up. Okay, I have one question uh, left before we open it up to your Q and A. But after this question, we're going to open it up to you. And so, if you would be thinking about what you would like to ask Lou tonight. And um, as our uh, greeter said, please raise your hand, ask one question, don't filibuster, and uh, we'll get to you in just a second. My, my final question, Lou, you've got an internal investigation, an internal audit going now, as well as, according to the media, a federal investigation of alleged improprieties with the Williams Fund. Could you kind of tell us what those alleged improprieties are and, and how they could have occurred? and what you're doing about them? Yeah. Well, I, I think, first of all, again, as I talked about the, the, the teams, um, I'm probably as, in, 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 as embarrassed about this as you possibly can. And because I'm the CEO of the organization, you know, I feel like I have to be accountable for that. I'm not going to back away from it. Um, yeah, there are a lot of uncertainties out there that we're trying to figure out and we, we've tried to communicate with our donors and our alums to say, try to answer the questions that we can because I think it's important that we give them the information that we have without jeopardizing the, uh, the process and the uh, uh, investigation. So we're trying to be uh, very open and direct about it um, as one might, 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 might realize when you're you're dealing with um, a program as complex as ours. Uh, we, we really work hard on policies and procedures, and there is no question that uh, our policy and procedure probably wasn't as good as we all thought it was. And uh, we're working very closely with some expertise to come in and help us make our policies and procedures better so that this could never happen again. 
but as I've been told by uh, a lot of people uh, that have uh, in private business have gone through something very similar, as many policies and procedures that you might think you have, if you have people who are dishonest, they can figure a way to, to beat the system. Uh, we we were very uh, we we've had uh, audits every year. You know, I'm big into auditing ourselves, and not meaning we do it, but we hire auditing companies. And been five different audit audits, and none of them picked this up. Uh, and I'm not blaming them because that's not what their responsibility is. But the, hopefully they would have caught it, but they didn't, uh, because it was you know from what we've been told, it was very. Uh, um, the people who were involved in it did it without probably none of us able to find out. We just kind of found out through a freak way, which I'm glad we found out. Um, I want to assure everybody that, you know, I, as soon as we found out about it, I went to the chancellor. I asked her uh, to start an investigation immediately. Uh, we went out and hired uh, a great uh, auditing firm that's going to come in, in a forensic auditing firm that's going to come in and um, help us put new procedures and policy in place so that, we, you know, hopefully we, this will never happen again. Um, the chancellor has been great. Uh, we also hired a law firm who uh, deals with criminal law and they're dealing with the federal investigators and in trying to come to a resolution on this. It's not as easy as you think it might be. It's very complex and we have to be very careful and make sure that we don't, we do everything by law and and follow the procedures as much as possible. Um, you know, I'm not one for tolerating illegal things. Uh, I try to play everything by the book. Uh, I'm not perfect. I don't pretend to be perfect. Uh, but when we have people who have violated uh, the law, uh, who have done things illegal, uh, we just don't tolerate that and we're gonna deal with that straight up. Uh, the other thing, Bill, that we have to let happen, we have to let the review take place. We can't interfere. We can't go too far ahead. I mean, there are a lot of days where I want to come in and just say, okay, let's do A, B, C, D, and E. And I've been, uh, the recommendation is we'll just let the process take place. At the end of the day, we're going to resolve it. And, and I'm convinced that we're going to be a better athletic program when it's all over with. Uh, it's a hard way to get better. Uh, and uh, I've taken this very personal and uh, uh, I, I am embarrassed that it's happened on, under my watch because I, I take great pride in myself and in, in trying to have the highest integrity. Uh, the one thing we ask our donors and our, our people uh, who, who are, have supported us is that, you know, give us some time. We're going to resolve it. We're going to get better. And uh, hopefully this will be a, a period of time in our athletic program that we can look back and say, you know what, this was not a lot of fun, but we're better because of it. So, Okay. We're ready for your questions now. John and Barbara have the microphones. If you have a question, raise your hand. We'll alternate to the extent we can from side to side. I'll let them select the people for the questions. John, you've got the first one. Looking into the future of sports television, do you expect that in the future, advertising will continue to support uh, college football and basketball, or do you think it may evolve to pay-per-view? Well, first of all, I think television is overrated right now. Not, I mean, we want to be on television every time we can because of you know, a lot of reasons. One, it's the public relations factor, and it's putting our product out, and we want to be able to recruit not only locally but nationally. Uh, but I think that I think that's a great question because the, the advertisement dollars are really dwindling. College television packages are dwindling. Uh, you know, we're in the process right now in, in the Big 12. We're looking at our, our next negotiation for our television. And we hired probably two or three different consultants. And one of the things that we're hearing is that the advertisement dollar on Wall Street is, is going in a different direction. You, you now you have uh, NASCAR and you have all these other kinds of things. And, and it, it wasn't the way it was 10, 15 years ago when it was just college football and college basketball. And, 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 and right now the whole NCAA basketball tournament, I was really, really pleased to uh, see the ratings this year 
uh, on the NCAA Final Four because they were up for the first time in the last five years. The, the ratings on uh, the Final Four has gone down significantly, and obviously that hurts us in our negotiation more. And I say ours, the NCAA negotiation for the Final Four because you know I think everybody in this room somehow or other is, is involved in business, and they're gonna, you're going to spend whatever. Uh, advertising dollars you have, you're going to try to put them in, in where you're going to have the most people watching that sport. So I think pay-per-view is going to be something that you're going to see more and more of. Um, unfortunately for us, we're, we're in a, a media market. Thank God we have Kansas City and Wichita, but you know, when you, you look at us, you know, we don't have a lot of households in, in the state of Kansas. And you know, we're talking with uh, Kansas State and some other people about maybe doing something kind of out of the box. Uh, despite what everybody thinks, uh, I have a great deal of respect for Kansas State and what they're doing and their new athletic director there. And we're trying to do a lot more things together. Do we have a question on this side? Right up here, Barbara. Well, you're way too diplomatic. There's probably several of us in the room that think Missouri should be banned from the NCAA. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my question. Uh, it's related to the last one. Um, the NCAA is probably one of the richest, most powerful sports organizations in the world. They're contemplating expanding the men's championship to 96 teams. You want to comment on whether you think that's a good idea or not? And do you think the NCAA would ever have their own network, like the NFL and the MLB? Uh, boy, that's a great question, Tom. Uh, first of all, let me say, in my opinion, the 96 thing is already done, even though they haven't voted on it. I, I think you said something very interesting, and I would disagree with that. The NSA is not one of the, the most wealthiest organizations. They are. They, like a lot of our schools, are struggling financially right now, and that's one of the reasons why they're looking at this 96. Uh, I think if you really fall, you know, it's, it's kind of like us, everybody thinks we're so flush with money and they don't understand what the expenses are. When you run a tournament like the NCAA uh, men's basketball and then the, God, I don't know how many other tournaments they have to run that don't make any money, uh, they don't have any revenue coming in. It's, it's expensive to run tournaments like golf and tennis and I'm, I'm all for them. I think it's important. I know what it costs us from a a uh, conference standpoint, I can't imagine what it costs from an NCAA standpoint, but you know, the NCAA you know, bought the NIT a couple of years ago for about $30 million, that's public knowledge. The NIT is not doing very well, and I think one of the reasons why they're looking at 96 because they can take those other teams, I think there's 36 of them, or, yeah, 34, 36 NIT teams and now make it into the NCAA. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they're looking at this tonight. But I do think it's a foregone conclusion that that's going to happen. Uh, personally, uh, I'm kind of a traditionalist. I like, I, mean, I like 32, but uh, you know we're at 64, and I think it's a, a good thing right now. And and I think there are going to be a lot of teams. And you know, and what's interesting, coaches are in favor of it. And, and the reason why coaches are in favor of it. They think it's going to save the jobs because they're going to say, well, I made the NCAA tournament. I might have been the 94th team that got in, but I, I got in. And, and they, I, we always laugh because most, most ADs think coaches think we're dumb. And, you know, Just because you're the 94th, the 95th, the 96th team to get into the NCAA tournament, you do that for four straight years, that's not going to save your job. So this, you know, it's pretty complex, but I think at the end of the day, uh, it's going to happen, so it's one of those things where, uh, personally, I would not be in favor of it, but you might as well buy into it and, and try to make it as best as you possibly can. Uh, I don't know if they can do that from a, um, a federal standpoint. Uh, if they had their own network, you would essentially lock out everybody else, all the other colleges, and I think there'd be, a tr you know, if you remember, Georgia and Oklahoma sued the NCAA for, and that's how they, they lost, the NCAA lost their uh, television package because it, it was the, the ability for Oklahoma, and, and I remind my good friends in Oklahoma now because they screwed it all up, and of course none of them were there then, but uh, 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 the feds came in and said, you can't, you can't make these teams play on television, and that's what happened. That's how the whole bowl thing happened. And, and I think uh, 
Did he answer your question directly? I don't think the NCAA could get away with doing it. It would probably be a good idea, but it would really hurt conferences and it would hurt you know, local school packages and all those kinds of things. I think they'd meet a lot of resistance. Okay, we have a question over here, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> My name is Neil Malachy. I'm not from the press. Okay. You um, can be. I'd like to return the financial question. You referred to the arms race. Uh, you referred to coaches' salaries. Ticket prices were mentioned. Your comment was, I don't make the rules. I try to follow them. My question is, why not make the rules? You're a person of great national stature, respected around the country. We all know the NCAA rule book is very detailed. Can't conferences get together and make some reasonable limits before this bubble bursts? And it will burst. It's out of control in the, in the views of some of us. And we look to people like you to provide leadership to provide some rules on this out of control expenditure. Thank you. I, I think that's a very, very fair question. Uh, I'm going to give you, uh, and not name the schools, because I think it would be very inappropriate. Uh, you know, ultimately, and, the, and I'm not saying this at Kansas now, please don't, so I'm not trying to, to even say this, but ultimately who makes decisions on coaches' salaries are either Board of Regents or presidents of the university. I've been in many meetings throughout my career and said that college presidents have said, we have to stop the arms race, have to. And the AD says, you're right. And then the coach leaves and they have an opportunity to hire the best football coach or the best college coach and, and uh, basketball coach or whatever. And, and the AD goes to the, the president and says, you know, Mr. President, Ms. President, uh, it's going to cost us $3 million or $4 million to get, this pres to get this coach. What do you want me to do? And they say, whatever it takes, get it done. So it, the fact that there's so much pressure on winning and making sure we hire the best coaches, and I think at some time, and I think it's going to happen, I agree with you, the bubble is going to break, it's going to burst. And I think college administrators and college, I don't think it's conferences. I think it has to be all the presidents get in the room and say, we're not doing this anymore. But again, you got to be a little bit careful on that because, you know, it's kind of like what I said about John Thompson. You, you know, we, we put a limit. The athletic directors put a limit and the NCAA put a limit on assistant coaches recently, about 10, 15 years ago, on the third or fourth assistant, I can't remember. And, and they filed a lawsuit against the NCAA and the NCAA lost the lawsuit and said you can't restrict salaries. And so there's all kinds of issues that are out there that maybe at the end of the day, administrators cannot restrict coaches' salaries or things like that. Um, I, I was in a situation I'll give you another example. At the University of Connecticut, uh, all, all the people, uh, I was the only one in the athletic department that wasn't unionized. Our, our men's basketball coach and football coaches were in the union. And uh, the union loved the fact that we paid those guys a lot of money because that meant they had to pay the union a lot of money. So when we tried to do some things with some coaches, the union came after us and we had to back off. So it's a lot more complicated, and, and I don't disagree with you, but it's very, very complicated, and it's not as easy as you think it could be to, to uh, tell administrators, uh, athletic administrators, you, you're not going to pay your coaches. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves, and I mean, I'm not, if, if Bill left, I mean, we're going to have to go out and hire the best coach we can find, and we're going to have to pay a lot of money. And if we don't do that, we're going to end up with a coach who can't compete, who can't win national championships, and then the president and I won't be here very long either. So it, it, it's much more complicated than you think it is. But there's going to be a time when the money runs out and we're not going to be able to do it. I totally agree with that. Anyone on this side? No? OK. I have a question right here. Yes, yes. ma'am. Wait, just change. wait for a microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Can we go here and I'll come right yeah, back? Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't realize you had somebody. That's my fault. I apologize. I'm sorry. Mr. Perkins, I'm Bill Gray. Please call me Lou. 
I'm old enough, I don't need that. That's all right, Mr. Perkins. Uh, I'm puzzled by some of the news reports I've, I've read in the last couple of days in, in involving the Joe College situation. It seems to me like the university successfully protected their, their intellectual property rights, had a jury determine that, they were successful in it, apparently spent in excess of $600,000 uh, uh, protecting those rights. I'm puzzled why the universe, how the university or the athletic department or Kansas athletics, whichever paid the bill, can justify to their donors or their taxpayers giving up that 600000 plus, forgetting that, writing it off, in exchange for, at least according, at least my perception of the news articles, in exchange for two guys agreeing to do something that anybody else can pick up the ball and do the same thing on? I think that's a very fair question, and uh, sometimes, as a, I think you, we said earlier, sometimes you make decisions that you go to bed at night and say, why did I make that decision? Uh, that was a, a, a joint decision made by a lot of people. I think ultimately at the end of the day, we weren't interested in hurting anybody. We were more interested in, in stopping the process of using our marks. We've worked, you know, when I came here, that was an issue that the university had, especially in athletics. You know, I, I can remember my first, first football game and I saw 85 different color blues uh, in the stands and 85 different color reds. And I used to ask the question to Chancellor Hemingway, are we KU or UK? Because we're the University of Kansas, but we're KU. And uh, he, he did a great thing, the university did a great thing, and they went out and, and hired this company, and, and they did a great job of brand, you know, giving us a brand, and we were able to come up with one color that belonged to the university. So at the end of the day, what we wanted to do is not hurt Joe College. We weren't interested in getting money even though a lot of people thought that, we were more interested in protecting the brand and protecting our color and our marks. And I think, I think right now it would be probably not very smart of anybody to go out, you know, we, we've let, we, we've allowed the system to work and the fact that Joe College will never have the ability to do this again I, and I think other companies realize that right now, um, and I don't think we're going to see that happen. And if that does happen, we'll, we'll treat it a little differently than we've treated this one. So uh, do I like paying the, the legal bills on it? No. Do I think uh, you know, uh, we could have gotten money from them, from, the, from Joe College? We probably do, could have, but that's not what we were trying to do. We, all we wanted to do was protect the university's brand, the athletic department's brand, to make sure that, because we work very hard to have that. And uh, uh, I think one can argue either way that we could have continued, and uh, I think we probably would end up paying more legal fees at the end of the day, because it would have gone to an appeal. And we weren't interested in doing that. We were more interested in settling the case and putting it behind us. Because this thing's been going on for about three or four years right now. Okay, right here now. My name is Judy. Hi, Judy. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for women's basketball. I enjoy women's basketball. I do, too. And second, my, but I'm going to completely switch. Okay. What are your thoughts on the BCS and the whole BCS bowl game thing and, and how we get to that point? Well, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but I can't help myself because um, I always get myself in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I am a very, very strong supporter of the BCS. Uh, I think we can improve it. I think it, uh, you know, when I went to, when I left Connecticut, right before I left, we built the football stadium and uh, I think if some people thought uh, I'd been criticized for a lot of things I've done here, I probably, it took me 10 years to get Division One football and to get a new stadium at, at Connecticut. And people thought I was nuts for doing it. And there were days where I woke up and thought I was nuts for doing it, but I was so concerned about our athletic program and what was going to happen to the future 
of Kansas basketball, baseball, tennis, because I, I said this publicly, and I'll continue to say this, that at some time, I don't know when, where, I'll probably not be here. I'll probably be in a rocking chair and, and hopefully have my granddaughter, granddaughters on my lap. But I believe at some time, the B, you know, in, in whatever you want to call it, forget about the BCS, but the six major conferences are going to say we've had enough and we're going to go do our own thing, and we're going to have our own quasi-NCAA, and we're not going to worry about anybody else. And we're going to do our bowl thing, and we're going to do our, have our own TV contracts, and we're going to have our own you know, uh, eligibility. and I, I believe that's coming, and that's why I did what I did, because I didn't want Connecticut to be left behind, because they would have been left behind if that thing happened today or tomorrow, because they didn't have the Division I football. And so I, I really believe very strongly, and, and again, I'm not going to say it's going to happen tomorrow, or next week, or 10 years from now, five, it's going to happen. And I hear, you know, I hear a lot of college presidents talking about those kinds of things. It, it's kind of like the salary issue. It's going to take one or two chances of presidents say we're done and we're going to form this other college division. It might be within the NSA, it might be outside the NSA. I don't know what that's going to be. And they'll have their own championship, their own television package, their own everything. Uh, you know, the, you, you hear about the Big Ten expanding, and you hear about the Pac-10, you hear about the Big 12 talking about. Eventually, there's going to be no more expansion except all of us are going to be in one pool together. So I, I'm a big believer in the BCS. Of course, I'm in a BCS school. If I was in a non-BCS school, I wouldn't like it. Yeah. So I think it's where you sit, but I'm a firm believer of, of what's happening to BCS. You know, before we continue, and I wish I had done this a little bit earlier, but I, I'm going to ask all the student athletes here just to stand up tonight. I think you guys need to be recognized. Come on, stand up. Thank you. Hopefully I can get some free golf lessons out of that deal. So we have a question back here, John. Wait, wait a second, Bill. I don't know if I have one of those shirts. I'm just not quite. I, we talked about branding all this time, and, you know, maybe, maybe we've got to tell the golf coach to get the right color. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the true KU. That's right. Good evening, Hi, Luke. Um, from time to time, um, I will hear university <laughs> members, it's not very, co very common, but it does happen, where they'll say, I have a sense or I believe that athletics might be taking from academics, taking from teaching, taking from research on campus. And I recently, um, as you know, served on certification for um, KU and the NCAA process and realized that that was not the case. Can you comment, therefore, on how athletics and academics have worked together, how athletics has worked with faculty, Question. and if they have at all uh, contributed to the research and teaching endeavor on campus. Well, you know, again, you know, we talked about family, and I, I'm a firm believer that our athletic department is part of the university family. Uh, I think this is my seventh or eighth university. I, I get, as I get older, I kind of forget which one it is. I, I probably should sit down and figure that out. but. I've always said to every president or chancellor that I've worked with, and Chancellor Hemingway has heard me say this to him many times, we would love to turn over all our revenue to the university and give us, guarantee us so much money that we can run our athletic pro program. And you know, people don't realize that there's a lot, you're seeing more and more private schools you know, my, my good friends at Notre Dame have a big $64 million contract from uh, NBC and television. All that money goes to the university. It doesn't go to athletics. But all their budget money comes from the university. They're a line item budget. So the fact that we've been asked to be self-sufficient but still have high academic integrity, still have you know, follow the NSA rules, you know, do all the, the social things that we have to do, the expectations are very high, and, and be competitive in everything we do. You know, unfortunately, it costs money. Uh, we have been very, very, very careful, and, and I know some people don't understand this and maybe don't even believe it, and, and I guess if I was on the other side of the fence, I wouldn't either, but I can honestly tell you, if we come into a situation where 
a donor says we want to give the money, we have the decision to make between giving it to the engineering department of the school of business or athletics. The first thing we say is you're going to make us a better athletic program if you give it to the school of engineering and the school of business. Because in order for us to recruit the kind of student athletes that we want to have here and the kind of schools we're recruiting, it, de it doesn't make sense for us to have a bad school of business, a bad school of engineering. You know, Cole didn't come here because we're a bad academic university. He came here because, or, or Daryl Stuckey, they came here because we have great, great academic programs. So it, it behooves us to make sure that all our academic programs are at the highest level. And again, think about the schools we recruit against on, on, almost on a, on a daily basis. It's, it's Stanford, North Carolina, Kentucky, you know, a Big Ten schools. I mean, they're all great academic schools. So we want, you know, the first thing that we have to do is to convince a young man or a young woman that we can provide them with the kind of education that any other school in the country is. So we want, we want all our academic programs to be successful. And, and we don't go around and talk about this a lot, but we have given back to the university uh, academic programs, uh, a lot of scholarship money and a lot of other kinds of things because it's important to us to have them be successful. Uh, you can debate this if you want to, and I'm sure you can, but I, I think we work as close, enjoy, I know you, you and several others, Jonathan, uh, sat on our, uh, our accreditation committee, and I think uh, everybody walked away uh, after basically about seven, eight months of, of working on this project and said that we probably have as good a relationship with our academic programs as any university. And we take great pride in that. Are we perfect? No. Uh, can we get better? Yes. And we continually work on that and we're always trying to find a way to get better with our relationships, uh, with our faculty and with uh, our university because, again, we are very proud of our university and we want to recruit the best student athletes to come to us. And in order for us to do this, we have to have a great academic program. We have time for one more question if uh, we have one on either side here. Do we have one over here? No? Over here? Right here. Last question. Hi, I'm Ian Sadler. I'm a sports management student here at KU. Um, I feel like we've been very well prepared in our program. I'm not just saying that because a few of my instructors are here. but. Um, <laughs> Uh, what words of advice uh, do you have for those of us that want to be successful in uh, collegiate athletics and um, what, what, what forms of preparation would you recommend for those of us that are wanting to get into it? Only joking, I would tell you to take, get a different major. <laughs> uh, I, I, I really think, uh, you know, we come across so many young people who want to go into sports management and they want to be athletic directors. And uh, I've spoken to a lot of classes. Uh, in fact, I, I'm going to have the great fortune. Uh, I'm really excited about teaching a class this coming fall in sports management on leadership. Uh, I can't wait. I'm excited. But I, I think what happens is young people look at salaries. They look at us watching games. They w look at us traveling. They look at what rings we're wearing. They look at all the things on the peripheral that at the, end of day, at the end of the day is great, but it's not what it's about. You know, you know I laughed uh, because Jonathan talked about a 40-hour week. I'm going to get myself in trouble because I work about 75, 80 hours a week, and my wife is going to ask why most athletic directors are working 40, and <laughs> she must think I'm doing something else besides working. Uh, it is very stressful. It's an unbelievable responsibility. Uh, it's not, you're always not going to be in a popular situation. Uh, I, I would say to anybody in sports management, and we are very, very lucky here, very lucky. We have one, of the, and I say this wherever I go, we have one of the best sports management programs in the country, and I hope the university continues to support it and do the kinds of things because it really helps us selfishly because we're able to take a lot of a, a sports management graduate students and put them to work and give them great experience. But my best advice is to make sure you understand the commitment that it takes to be a sports administrator. I don't care if it's sports administration. I mean, we talk about Paul right now, and Paul, how long have you been doing this business now? 25 years. You can't imagine the stress that he's under every day. 
making sure that we have the best program in the country and providing our student athletes. So it can be in any part of sports administration. There is so much stress and there's so much things that you have to deal with. Make sure this is what you want to do the rest of your life. Because there, even though there, I, mean, I wouldn't trade my occupation for anything in the world, but it takes a major commitment from you, yourself, and your family. And, uh, and it's not unlike some other jobs. I mean, I, it's, we're not the only profession in the world that has that kind of thing, but it's, it's pretty tough. So make sure you know what you're getting yourself into and, and make sure you have a clear understanding of what it's all about. But I admire you for being, doing it too. Lou, thanks so much. So, thank Great you. to have you here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.